Well, hello everyone and welcome to the latest episode of Switch of Play with myself, Mark Simpson, and of course, Pools legend Mickey Barron. Good evening, Mickey. How are you tonight? Very well, thanks, Mark. I've had quite a good day. I've managed to get out on the golf course and play a few holes with a good friend of mine, Danny Evans. Excellent. Um, so I've actually had a, a nice day and it's, it's been nice to actually speak to someone a little bit different rather than either to do with a family or to do with work. So it's been, a, it's been a good day. Did the golf go your way or was it just a bit of a friendly affair? Well, just, just by one on the last hole. So um, it was up and down. We had some good holes, some bad holes. But uh, as I say, the company was probably more important than the golf. And in terms of the podcast so far, I mean, this is what episode four now, and I'm, honestly, I'm bowled over by the reaction. I, I'm loving doing it, loving having this crack with you and the other people who've we've had on. But the feedback seems to suggest that, that the people watching and listening are enjoying it too, which is good. Yeah, I, I mean, I, it's hard to get everyone's opinion and, and and think what everyone. But I've had a lot of the lads who were in my WhatsApp group and people who are in football or or recently football said how much they're enjoying it and think if football is enjoying The one thing I did like the other day about the one that was there was people from Walsall that commented on and had listened to it and had said, look, he's, an, he's a good guy and we're lucky to have him. And, and that's, I know that's a side that Daryl wanted to get across as well rather than the, yeah. the joker side that everyone knows about. Um, so yeah, it's been absolutely amazing and just hope that everyone keeps on listening and, and uh, watching and hopefully with the guests coming up we can get some more people. Oh, the guest coming up we've got is Chris Turner, who's had long-standing uh, uh, affiliation with the football club. You were there when he first arrived. How much are you looking forward to getting his take on things now a few years on? Yeah, it, it, it'll be interesting. I think um, Chris was always great for me as a manager. He was, he was uh, someone that really turned the club around, you know. And I think as myself as a player and as, as a group of players and fans as well, we've got a lot to thank Chris for. And, and we're going to ask him about, especially that time when he arrived and how he managed to do that. But Chris was just a good guy. He liked he liked his football. He, he liked being a manager, and he liked having a bit of fun as well. Which, when you put all those things together for a player, that's that's what you want. So here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Chris Turner. Uh, good evening, Chris, and welcome along to Switch of Play. Thanks for joining us. Pleasure, Mark and Mickey. Good to see you both. Hi, Chris. Hi, Mickey. And I guess first off, just um, how, how are you keeping? You know, obviously it's a, it's still quite a strange way of life we're leading at the moment. How are, how are things treating you? Good. I mean, <clears throat> the last 10, 12 weeks, um, been doing plenty of walking with my dog. My wife's been off as well. So um, it's been um, very uh, strange times walking, you know, walking up to somebody and body swerving them. Um, <laughs> For uh, by two meters, <laughs> seeing people 30 yards slowly moving away from it, but uh, you, you, you know, I've got used to it. And, and we, we've been walking five, six miles every day, so it's uh, it, it's, it's been good. Good, uh, you know, sometimes when you see that you're living with somebody for on top of each other for 10 weeks and hardly going anywhere, uh, we, we, uh, we've done very well. And now she's gone back to work, so I'm lonely now. <laughs> I'm coming on here. <laughs> Mickey's just been saying he's had a game of golf today. Have you had it? Have you been on the course yet since the reopening? I haven't played golf for about three years. Have you not? No, no, I've not. I've, I've not. Uh, I didn't have the time for a long time, and then and then just got out the habit of playing. Yeah. Play. I was going to be playing in the Hartlepool Golf Day, which was supposed to be in May, mm. but obviously that got postponed. But uh, maybe it's play it when it's uh, when it's uh, put back up. Yeah, I'm the same, Chris. I've not played for probably two years, and it's only because I've got a bit of time on my hands at the moment. Yeah. But, but, um, and I actually played with, with Danny Evans today from Dyke House, who is a right. friend of mine. And he hasn't been out much at all, because he lives on his own, and he's like, I just want to get out and have a, a different scene. Where, so did where did you play? We played up near me, we played a course called South Moor. Um, right. so it was really good and, and uh, good condition as well, but it's, it's sort of gets an interesting golf going again. You think, I'm not going to have the time to do this when everything's back to normal. No. But, no, it was a good, good day. It's the four hours that it takes to go around. I mean, I just be playing the first day, same, playing badly and walk off, go and have a few pints <laughs> in the bar. <laughs> and by the time they're all coming in, I've had too many. Good day, though. Yeah, that, I just whip the a... golf out and go for the pints in the bar. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That was a strange thing to do when you finish and you just go back to your car. 
yeah. you like, right, same way. And then you couldn't go for a pint, you couldn't go over a cup of coffee yeah. or a toasty, and, yeah. and that was a strange thing. I remember when I played, we had a we had a we had a golf day at Manchester United, and um, after the after the event at the end of the night, as as everybody knows, them boys could drink forever, and it was forever. It's three or four in the morning, and we're leaving, and Gordon McQueen. Uh, goes up to the fireplace in a, in a top-notch golf club just outside Manchester, rolled the carpet up, put it over his shoulder. I said, what are you doing with that, Gordon? He said, well, I've got to make an excuse why I've been late going home. This is my price for the golf. <laughs> 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 he, nicked, he nicked the carpet out of the golf club, took it home, gave me his missus as a, he got a prize in the golf. This was absolutely huge <laughs> the golf. There was a pretty guy, Gordon, Chris, I had him at middle was oh. reserve. Yeah. Coach. Yeah. I mean, you wouldn't, you, honestly, from day to day, you never knew what was going to happen. Um, one time, he, um, he found out we're all being out on a drink and we're in train the next day. And we're at Ayrson Park, so he'd come in, he'd be real tall, intimidating guys. Yeah. He's like, right, get your trainers on. And we're all sat there, our heads are like, oh, God, the last thing we want to do is go running. And Gordon never did anything. He never, like, ran. He never did any weird. He kicked the odd football now and again. And he put his trainers on, he set off from Ayrson Park and he started running and we were like, I tell you what, Gordon's still quite fast, are you? <laughs> I came up with him and he ran us for about 400, 500 metres straight away from Ayrson Park. He stopped. So he went, right, everyone stop here. And we're all panting, trying to get. He turned right near the snooker club, took us all in for a big fry up and went, right, lads, <laughs> off the wall. <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> Well, I mean, he, 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 loved, he loved a drink. We went to Hong Kong. He was playing for Hong Kong Rangers, I think it was at the time. And he came out for three days, never went home, and very rarely slept. And, and uh, he, he, he could drink for that, for Scotland. Yeah. I remember when he was our reserve team manager at Middlesbrough Sundays, we'd be playing in the trade and we'd be doing like the 7v7. And he just he sat like looking over at the first team that was trading over there. And you'd be like almost thinking, Gordon, can you watch what's happening here? And in the yeah. end, you'd go, ah, lads, just sit down. Just sit down. Just have a watch of these lads over there. And you'd just <laughs> watch them first. We'd just be I'm watching them. <laughs> nice guy. Good lad. Lovely lad. Lovely lad. How else have you been keeping busy than Chris in, in recent years? It, it, the Wakefield FC thing, is that... <clears throat> yeah, that's taken up quite a bit of my time up. That's... Uh, it's uh, the biggest city in the UK without a professional football club. Yeah. And um, we're obviously starting at the lowest of lowest of levels that you can. And um, it's to get young players in who, who go on education courses, which then makes them a bit able to afford to live in the house that we provide them with. Um, and, you know, this, this summer, this is our second season, had over 450 applicants who want to come and join us. So it's been, it's really t taken off and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's got a chance of being successful. Something you're enjoying as well, obviously. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the big thing is, is that the bigger, the bigger picture is we, we're going in a 12 million pound uh, stadium, um, which was going to be built before this, uh, <laughs> this disease came and just collapsed everything. Um, but no, there's a 12 million pound st stadium be being developed for uh, Wakefield Trinity. We're going to be the football club in. There's going to be women's football um, and other sports going in there. A trust that's going to run it, etc. Uh, and there's going to be a new training complex for for ourselves and and Wakefield Trinity. So uh, everybody's pulling together. Wakefield Trinity, who, who I thought might be a little bit, well, we don't want football, but they do. They're actually over the moon with it, and they, uh, and they're getting involved with it. And, Hopefully, it, it, it's going to snowball and long after time, when, 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 when I'm not here, um, Wakefield still has a football team and it's somewhere up the, up the league ladders and it's, I'm just getting it going, getting it started. So how, how did you get involved with that, Chris? Do you know someone that was there or do you know... Well, we used to have a, there used to be an academy and, and, and uh, these lads all thought they were going to be professional footballers and, and thought it was easy and thought that, you know, we'll go and play Leeds and we'll go and play Barnsley and, Somebody will pick me up, a uh, best player there, and, and sign me. And we played about 20 games. And I said to the owner, I said, the, we're, we're wasting these boys' time. We ain't going to get no players signed up. Um, so I said, what they need to be doing, they need to be playing men's football, playing men's league. So we played last year in the Sheffield County Senior Premier League. 
and did reasonably well with a group of lads that weren't really um, scouted. We, 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 they came, we coached them and, and we played them in games and we did okay. Um, but they need to be playing in men's football. So mm -hmm. I brought in a coach called uh, Adam, Adam Lockwood's going to run our team next season. And um, we, we, we're sifting through applicants now and players and having some trial days um, to, to, to get a team together to hopefully win that league so we can go into step six the following season, which is semi-pro level. Chris, I'm still training you over 40s if you want to come down well, with some expenses. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you're most welcome. You're most welcome to my trial, son. <laughs> You've done more or less every every job across football now, Chris. Obviously, you 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 came through as a you, you did your playing career. You went into youth team coaching. You've done managing. You've done chief executive chair 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 side of things. You've looked at different areas. It's really varied your career. It's turned out, hasn't it? I've had a fantastic time. I mean, forty five years in in professional football. That you know, from leaving school at fifteen and and uh, coming up sixty two and and. Uh, Still been in a little bit involved. I'd like to get back in the in the, in the on the professional side again. Got have one more go or, or, or involved with a club if possible. But um, the 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 uh, it's been fantastic. And, and like I say, I've done I've done virtually every uh, every position. Worked in boardrooms. Worked in uh, in youth football uh, and, and obviously uh, uh, managerial positions. What side is it that you would want to go back into now? Then is it the business side or would you want to go? Get back in the no, game. just football. Football business side's a waste of time because you can't make ends meet in a football club. You know, yeah. you, 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 you're losing money all the time. And um, you know, at Chesterfield, I brought I brought them in in five <coughs> five years at six and a half million pounds in in player sales, and we're still losing a million pound a year, yeah. uh, and they're still losing now a million pounds a year. Um, it's that ex it's expensive running a football club, and if you haven't got the resources to keep putting in, putting in, putting in, like Ken did with Iowa uh, over an 18-year period, I think he put some of that 18, 19 million pounds in. Um, unless you're willing to do that, you, you're going to have your chances of success are very, very limited. And um, so, you know, and when you're chief exec, you get some fans who are saying we're not buying enough. You get some fans saying we're losing money. What you're doing? Where's all the money going? And and uh, you know, so you get you get pressure from all sides, and then you get the owner saying, "Ways bills too high. Can we get this down?" And it's all right when you win. It's when you're losing, and there's always it becomes a day when you're losing. So unfortunately, do you know with like the financial situation and lockdown with clubs now? Do you think we'll still have all the clubs when the new season starts in the football league, or do you think we might lose some or? I th I'd like I'd like to think we would still have the seventy one um, league clubs that's left, but I do fear for um, a high number will be struggling and will go into administration. It's really uh, I think it's a reset time for football, and I think you know I mean in your era, my era, years before you, Mickey, um, the wages have just been spiraling out of control, and clubs can't afford them, and. Uh, it's um, it, it, it's going to be that the, the, the fittest will survive, and a lot of weak clubs could possibly go by the wayside, which will be uh, very sad. I think Daryl, I spoke to Daryl last week before he came on, and he more or less said the same thing. He said it's it's going to be a time for football to have a real good look at itself from the inside, and he said he thinks in the next eight eight months that the football clubs will take control again, and they'll have the power back. Because they have to, they the, have players, to. the players but, but, can't command figures that they would have been with. For me, for me, uh, now's the time for, for the EFL and for the clubs to, uh, uh, for such as agents' fees, which is a massive uh, drain on, on Premier League as well. Um, I, I, I would do right across the board that uh, clubs do not pay agents' fees anymore. And the players will have to pay for their own agent. Now, now's the time, because thirty years ago they could have stopped it when the PFA first came out and started introducing agents from PFA, which was a straight five hundred pound per deal. That's fine. Um, 
they could have kept with that, but they lost. They lost out. They didn't. They didn't do anything, and then it spiraled over the last thirty years out of control. Agents' fees. I'm not against agents. There's some very good agents out there, um, but what I am uh, against is when clubs are paying agents' fees for re-signing a player that's already there. Uh, players are being moved around simply because agent wants a fee, another fee for uh, on another deal. Um, and, and at the end of the day, football clubs can't afford it. They cannot afford it. They've gone with it, but they can't afford it. Now's the chance to readdress that, that certain thing. And I would look at um, the proposal that I read the other week regarding um, trying to uh, get more local derbies, look closer clubs playing in Leeds, where away fans can travel in good numbers, um, more local interest. I mean... Hartlepool, for instance, playing Dover in the National League is is just not common sense. Mm. Hartlepool should be playing the likes of Chesterfield, Notts County, Mansfield, um, Carlisle, all in the league, all in the same league. Because leagues one and two, if they could just provide teams for the championship out of leagues like that, I think there'd be more interest, bigger crowds uh, and a bigger incentive rather than um, seeing these clubs playing in front of small crowds uh, and disintegrating, really. So, Chris, you mentioned about all the investment that IOR put in. If we can, let's take you back to the, the, you know, the first sort of flickerings of interest you had in the, in the Hartlepool United job. Um, tell us how it came about. I know you, it culminates in the story where you went to watch them and then left again. You, you, know, you, you went to watch Hartlepool yeah. in action, didn't you? Well, you know, I, I was a Wolves team, Wolves youth team coach, and we had an exceptional uh, group of players: uh, Matt Murray, the goalkeeper; Julian Lescott, centre half; Lee Naylor, left back; Keith Andrews in midfield; Robbie Keane up front. All those players played for played for the country at very high levels, and we were winning the leagues and the cups and everything else, and producing players for the first team. But one day, the PFA guy came to me, and I was having a chat with him, and we were saying, "Well, youth teams all all going to change." So, so what, what do you mean you're going to change? Well, unfortunately for the coaches, you're going to spend more time behind the laptop, more time filling in forms, more time sitting down and speaking regarding other issues other than football. And I thought to myself, well, maybe this is the time for me now to step up from, from being a youth team coach uh, and see uh, about first team. So uh, a few weeks later, Hartlepool United job came up. I applied for it. I was interviewed in Newcastle by Ken O'Croft and uh, Harold Ornsey and Ian McRae. And um, I waited and waited and waited and didn't hear a thing. And three weeks went by, four weeks went by. And uh, uh, I said to Debbie, my wife, I said, I, I don't think they're going to appoint a manager. So on the forthcoming Saturday, I had no youth team game. So I said to, uh, I rang Ken up. I said, uh, Ken, uh, I've got no youth team game on Saturday. You're playing at Exeter. Is it worth me going down to watch the team? And if Ken said, um, well, no, I don't think you need to do that. I think, well, I'm wasting my time. I'm staying at Wolves. But he said, yeah, yeah, it'd be good if you can go down, do a report on the team. There's a report you used to have to do. Uh, and, 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 let, and, let, and let me know, you know. He says, we, we, we're thinking about making an appointment next, next week. So then I go down. The team's winning 1-0. I think Peter Bisley scored a, a penalty early on. And the team's hanging on, hanging on. But Exeter never looked like scoring a goal. It was just coming five, ten minutes ago. We parked in the car park across the road, which was a spiralling car park. So if you get caught in the crowd there, you could be in for an hour. So we left. I was standing with the Exeter fans on their cup in, the, in those days. We got in the car. I was driving up the, out the way. I put the radio on. Uh, Exeter had just hit the post. But we're now in injury time. I said to Debbie, I said, well, they ain't going to appoint a manager next week because if they win today... They'll try and keep that momentum going. Um, and then uh, an hour or two later, I uh, got a phone call from, the, from his son. He said, great result that today, Dad. I says, yeah, but they're not going to appoint a manager next week, are they? What's the point? He says, no, oh, they lost 2-1. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> no, they conceded two goals, in, which I know we shouldn't be laughing, but they conceded two goals in, the la in injury time. And consequently, I was on the training ground on the Monday and I got my phone rang and, and it was Ian McRae saying they'd like to offer me the, the posi position at the club, which I was delighted to accept. Was I, was I playing that game? Because I can't remember that. <laughs> uh, back four. Uh, I don't think you might not have been playing. 
must must have been injured. <laughs> been, no, no. Or unless you came off, you must have come off, Mick. <laughs> yeah, five minutes to go. <laughs> <laughs> Your memory's shocking at the best of times, Mickey. You can't remember the good times at all, bad one. I can't oh. remember many, but I can remember that game. Remember <laughs> that game. Um, but no, I, I watched Hartlepool play a few weeks earlier at Rochdale. At Rochdale, um, I think they may have lost two 0 at Rochdale. But the player, the player who I liked in the team, I got the job on the Monday. I was told, you know, the job's yours. And on the Thursday, which might have been transfer window time, I'm not sure. But the one player who I felt that we could build a team round who could do some damage and do well. Wasn't having a great time at the club at the time, Stevie Howard. And my first game was Rotherham at home on Saturday. Ronnie Moore, team top of the league, bombing away with everything. Big, strong, powerful team. And I had lost my centre forward on the Thursday. So I was left going against Rotherham, who had three giants of a centre-backs, Branson, McIntosh and a another. I had Craig Midgley and Stewie Irvine, both <laughs> five ten. I'm trying to get a goal. <laughs> and and, and uh, we got a nil-nil, fully enough. And it was the first time I'd been on the pitch, which was an absolute, you know, a better off than um, on Blackpool Beach, really, when the horses and donkeys had been on it. Um, and I was walking across the pitch to the, uh, the then Millow stand, and a voice came out the stand. There weren't many in the stand. And one of them says, Turner, what have you come in here for? What's all this about? I thought, well, that's a great welcome. <laughs> and Ronnie Moore, Ronnie Moore was about 30 yards behind. And he had a big, long, black crombie on. And he was strutting across the pitch, top of the league. We'll get three points here this afternoon. And a guy shouts out, hey, Ronnie, when's the funeral start? <laughs> So uh, that was my welcome to uh, Victoria Park. Was it a daunting thing to do, though, because you were coming into a club, I guess, who hadn't been blessed with a load of success in those recent years, and you know, been fighting against relegation. I guess you know, was it a, was it a, a daunting task, or did you jump at it straight away as soon as you got a chance? No, I, ju I jumped at it because I had belief in uh, in my ability. I was a young coach now, wanting to become a manager. Uh, I did know, and I did realise the record of Hartlepool managers. Everybody eventually got sacked and and majority of the managers that they had before had been promoted from the within. So I think I was one of the first, if not the first manager for a long time that, that was coming from the outside. So um, I took my principles into the uh, into the club. There was 14 games to go. We drew 0-0 against um, Rotherham. We then drew one all at Peterborough. <coughs> can't remember the next game, but then after, we went to Torquay. Torquay. That was a telling game for us because we, uh, the player who played for Torquay was Effian Williams. And when I went to, uh, to um, Hartlepool, a friend of mine at Wolves, Chris Evans, told me, he says, if you want to, if you want to strike a go and get Effian Williams from uh, the Welsh club he was playing for. So I sent Tommy Miller down to watch uh, Effium play and he came off uh, after five minutes with a with an injury with an hamstring. A um, couple of weeks later, um, Effium had signed to Torquay for seventy grand, and I could have signed him, but I hadn't seen him play. And as my first managerial job, I didn't want to sign players I hadn't seen play. Spend seventy grand, and you know, Tommy told told me what he saw, what he thought, and. Um, when I saw him on the pitch at Play More that afternoon, warming up, I knew straight away I should have signed him. He looked strong, good legs, powerful runner, scored three that day and beat us 3 0. Um, and then, when the first chance I had to possibly get him for 30 grand uh, 18 months later, which we did, and Effion was a great signing for us and did extremely well for the club. So Chris, obviously the, the end of that season we stayed up and it was probably the next season where I first thought, you know what, things are going to change. There's going to be a real shift in sort of momentum of the football club right from the first day of pre-season. We just seemed to, not overnight, but suddenly become a more professional 
club. The training facilities were better. The, the, the training kit was better. We went on pre-season. Yeah. Tour, I think went down to Wheels. And, and, and I, I think the previous year, uh, we'd been pre-season to Hoffel. I'd actually spent a week in Hoffel. So, <laughs> we played Chester Street. I'll never forget it. We played Chester Street, a pre-season friendly. And I said to Mick Tate, I was like, Gaffer, is all right if I just go home for one night? I said, it's two miles from my house. He's like, no, Mickey, everyone has to go back. So we spent, I'll never forget, we had seven nights in Hoffle. And every night we're getting a Chinese because we weren't getting any food. Right. The lads probably after that week put on weird because we were eating yeah. that because there was no facility. Yeah. But it was, just, it was such a change in sort of mentality of the football club when that next season when you, I think, well, when you can start really laying down yeah. your plan. Well, I mean, I, I, you know, and I'm not knocking people there before me or play, uh, people that were, were there because the, the, the culture had been like this for a long time. And, and just to stay in League Two was, was a goal, was a main goal. Is not to get not to get relegated into the conference, and I didn't want that to be the goal. I wanted to be the goal was to get out of League Two and go into League One, um, and the only way you can do it is by having discipline and uh, work ethic and a style of play that, that obviously wins games. And I, I looked at the squad and I looked at the training. We needed a fitness coach. I mean, I will back me on, on and, and probably the best thing is is to bring somebody from the outside who's been at you know so-called bigger clubs and work with a good brand of managers and coaches, uh, come into the club at Hartlepool and change the training routines, change the uh, attitude, change the the goals situation um, of where you want to go, and um, and 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 uh, try and be successful. And fortunately, over three and a half years, we were and everybody bought into it eventually. And, um, you know, we, we, we got to a point where I thought we were going to win every week in the, in the last year and a half there. I thought we, we'd win every game. It was, it was a strange period, wasn't it? It was, it was before I got to the club, so I don't know it, it you know, in, in, inside out. But three playoff seasons in a row, wasn't it? And three playoff Hartley. Yeah. The first time that Hartlepool had got to the playoffs... But yeah. you just couldn't get past that next hurdle, could you? No. Well, I mean, the last one, the Cheltenham one. I mean, we outplayed Cheltenham at home, and they scored a goal in the injury time to make, to, to to get a one all. Yeah. We we drew one all down there, but we absolutely played them off the park, and we, you know, in 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 normal time, and in extra time, we had chances to have won the game and deserved to have won the game. And I, and I knew if we'd have got through to the final at Wembley, we, you know, our, our footballing ability. Was uh, would have I think it was Lincoln City would have beaten Lincoln City, um, but <clears throat> my my first interview after the Cheltenham game, I said there in my first slides that I'm 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 delighted with the season, but I, I do I do now stand here and, and and believe we will win the league next year, because I know I've got a team that can win home and away on a consistent basis, which we were doing, and I know that uh, this team will get promoted next season. And I had that much confidence in those players. And the way we worked and everything else, and we had a great team spirit, as Mickey knows. And, you know, that team um, and, and those building in that team lasted at Hartlepool for another three or four years, well after me. You know, your Tinklers and, and Mickeys and Humphreys and uh, Effie and Williams. You know, they played in some massive games for the club in the next three to four seasons. And, and that was from the recruitment that we did very early on at the club. I know you, you, you were obviously in, involved in those, Mickey. I mean, did, is that something you felt as well? I know there was disappointment at Cheltenham that probably took a little bit of time to process, but during the summer, were you thinking the same as Chris has just said there, that, you know, this is we're going to do this now? Yeah, I think I think at the Cheltenham game, like Chris said, we did play really well. And it, it's not like, I remember we played Blackpool in the playoffs and we got absolutely hammered off Blackpool. And yeah. you come away thinking, you know what? It, it's almost a bit of a Even though the we got beat and people were really disappointed. I remember I had to ring home the next day and check he was all right. I spoke him the day after. And it was about two or three days. And it took me a while to go in the penalty. But then he, he almost said, well, that's gone now, but we will get promoted next day. We will win that league. And all the lads when you spoke them had that mentality about them. And it was almost like we, we could do... Just going back to work the next week, 
and start the season already because we wanted to get going because we wanted to show everyone that next year we would win the league or get promoted. Mm-hmm. And just like the Cheltenham game, Richie got a lot of stick for that penalty and I know he wrote a book about it and this, that and the other. But Daryl Clark missed an absolute sitter in that game. He did. I don't Darryl, remember that. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was towards the end of the game or an injury. Uh, an Over the bar? And he never got any grief for it at all because uh, everyone yeah. concentrated on his penalty. But if you look yeah. at that game, Daryl missed an absolute sitter. We, we should have won that. We should have won yeah. the game. We yeah, won. yeah. We should have won the game. You mentioned there, Chris, Chris, it's one of the things that came up um, when we were speaking to Darrell last week about the signings you made, um, you know, to, to come into that squad. And, the, and as, as you rightly say, that they were the mainstay and not only just those seasons, but they're still big mates now. The spirit was second to none. And that's really, really hard, I imagine, as a football manager to put together. How much work went into the, you know, it was one of the things Darrell mentioned last week. How much work went into what kind of characters you were bringing in as well as, what ability they could bring to the dressing room? Well, I think it, the, the, whatever football club you are, there, there is, there is, um, uh, it, the, each club has its own um, sort of um, um, aroma where, where players have got to get into this uh, uh, situation. I felt that Hartlepool, <clears throat> you needed hard-working players. You needed uh, a spirit with those players, um, and you you needed them. You know, every away trip's four or five hours. You know, so you've got to you've got to uh, in, in, install this, and, and the home games. You know, got to make it a fortress. I mean, the biggest disappointment for me in the last six, seven years, Hartlepool's not been a fortress. Yeah. You know, the home games they haven't won the home games. I mean. Um, it's it, it, Hartlepool should be winning the home games simply geographically. Teams are coming a long way. Don't disappoint them. Send them back down. Have a, have a funny story was we played Barnet all night at home, and Tony Cotty was the manager, and I think we beat them six or seven nil. It was uh, unbelievable, and you know that's the sort of that's the sort of um, result. And I mean, Swansea, we put seven past seven, five past Orient, you know, in our, when we're really kicking off. That's what Hartlepool need. And that's what I believe that, 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 that we needed to get to. Teams don't want to come and play up there. So make sure they don't come up there and play. Make it a fortress. And then if we win eight or nine away games and install this in the players, and then everything after that, we'll get promoted. We'll be in the top three, top four, and which which we were, and we should have been promoted the year before when Chesterfield went up, when they were doing all sorts of stuff behind the scenes, which the EFL or the Football League in them days should have should have put them out further down the league, and we should have gone up in third spot, in my opinion. But um, no, it's hard work putting a team together. I mean, I went to Sheffield Wednesday. And I had 14 months with four other managers, players, in then 14 months. I got my boys in, or the boys in. I brought 12 players in. And I think eight of them played in the final against Hartlepool at, at Cardiff at the end of the season. Um, and my disappointment there is, is that I had 14 months of having to battle and try and survive and keep things going until I could get rid of all these players who were then out of contract and then bring my players in. And if you can have the opportunity of being able to bring your players in what in your mind you know how they can play and you get them and mould a team. I mean, you know, when you look at the team uh, that we had, uh, you know, Graham Lee was a fantastic, uh, strong, powerful centre half. Uh, Paul Smith on the wing had a wonderful left foot. If that ball went out to him, he whipped that ball in. You know, who's in the middle to put the ball in the back of the net? If you give him two or three chances, he'll score one at least um, with uh, with flash. And, um, you know, Mark Tinkler in midfield uh, was a tremendous switcher changer of play. And when we played 3-5-2, for instance, we'd be going down one flag out, the, out to Mark, ping it out to the other side and change the point of the attack. We had some marvellous players. Chrissy, uh, Chrissy Westwood, you know, Mickey was a fantastic player and servant for us. Um, and, and um, you know, really got an enjoyable bunch of players that were a, a, a joy to coach. And as a manager, as a manager, uh, very rarely, unless you're an Alex Ferguson and people like that right at the very top, as a manager, it's very rare you can 
you can stand on the sideline and just before the whistle blows, you know your team is better than the opposition. I, I mean, I, I had that at home. And um, I went to Sheffield Wednesday <laughs> and I was standing on the touchline there. I knew I had got a good team playing against the opposition. But I got 20,000 fans who, who, who demanded that they were better. But unfortunately, they weren't. And it took, like I said, 14 months to, 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 to stir that up and, and, and turn that around for them. Going back to, I mean, I remember when those types of players were coming in, Chris, and, and, and Richie was coming in, and, and Tommy Widrington, and, and Bassett. Kevin Henderson, great signing. And, and all these players, and they were making the team better and better all the time. But I honestly believe that when, when we used to go to Holland pre-season, because where we went was brilliant. It was it was a professional yeah. place. There wasn't a lot to do. And and it got the lads to sit down together, and you, you get to know them, and you you would have a big crap with them. We'd be in the corridor playing cricket, and, and everyone yeah, would be yeah. playing yeah. cricket. But even on the nights out, I remember one night we had... Um, I think you and Wesley had said, right, we can have a night out, but there's a curfew. I think it was like 11 o'clock, half 11. <laughs> so, and, and a minute, I'll never forget it. As we walked out, you went, uh, Mickey, no singing. There's no singing. They're not allowed to sing tonight because we used to like having a sing song. <laughs> you were in one pub up the road with the staff, and I remember the lad was sat outside and, and flashed had a bottle of champagne. He knew he reckoned he didn't drink. He had his bottle of champagne himself. <laughs> And one of the lads got some shots, so I think Daryl or Tings was like, right, we'll have a sing song. And well, two seconds later, Westy come down. Lads, Gaffer said, no singing. We can hear you up there. You've got to be respectful of this, that, you know. So Tings like, sorry, sorry, Colin, sorry, Colin. And then I remember Daryl going, anyway, where's the Gaffer at? Let me speak to him. <laughs> so I went to the pub where you and Colin were. All the lads trailed up to this pub. Tings gone, Gaffer. What's this curfew all about? How are you, Gaffer? Come on, you know what that was like. Trent. Yeah. I remember Chris stood up, he got his glass up in the air, and he went, Lads, the curfew's off in the whole pub. <laughs> 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 Little things like that. It, it, yeah. it, it helps that team spread for the rest of the season, but it was such a good place to do that because it was so professional. It was yeah. the, the little shawl of being in Holland, if you like. And it, yeah. it was. It was a brilliant start of the season for us. Well, I mean, once again, that's how you are. But you know, back in back in what we were trying to do, Colin and I, and and, and uh, um, trying to get us to be as 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 good as what we could get, really. Uh, there's always bigger clubs in the league than than ourselves, and um, you know they they they're supported in 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 all efforts to, to to improve. And I've always believed that you need a good team spirit amongst the players, even amongst the staff. You know, we had a great staff at the club over the years at Hartlepool. Russ Green came to the club further further down the line. And we had, a, a, you know, it was <laughs> it was an unbelievable time. Right up to 2011, the football club was 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 in League One. And, and um, you know, there, there was a great spirit at the club on and off the pitch. Going back to one of the players that you mentioned, Chris, and I've had a few people... Um want me to ask you about him tonight you mentioned before flash um, how did you manage to get him to come to the club and, and basically what a sign he was for us and i still I, I mean i'll say this to flash's face flash was only wanted to score goals i remember having arguments galore with him about that he wouldn't do anything else to help the defense i remember he came in somewhere at that time and oxford. He, he, he oxford scored a one or he scored a couple was it oxford well, and he turned well, two goals what you what you's not doing back there? I've scored two, we're not even winning. And I was like, ready, I was ready to rip his head off. But I know you were. I know. I, I, I tell I tell that story. I tell that story many times. We're two 0 up. We're coasting. We're playing well. We're two 0 up. And right on the stroke of half time, on the far side, uh, we allow a cross to come into the box. Bit of a scramble. Two one. Right on the stroke of half time, which then puts pressure right on us. So I'm going in there at half time and as I'm going in at half time he comes in at the back and goes hey I've got you lot two goal lead what's happening at the back of the was <laughs> and uh, I'm thinking hey it's all going to kick off here and Mickey starts having a go at him I thought I'll go to the back and have a, a quiet cup of tea at the far <laughs> side and let's see what develops but uh, that's Flash I mean I got Flash because uh, when I was at Manchester United a boy called uh, Neil McNabb lived, lived just up the road. 
and um, we got friendly, me, me and uh, uh, Neil and, and the two wives. And one day, um, Neil, Neil was, uh, uh, my wife was speaking to Neil's wife, who was coach at, uh, at Portsmouth. And while he's on the phone, Neil says, hey, 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 let, let me speak to Chris. He says, hey, he said, uh, tell you who's been training with us. You'll know him from Sheffield Wednesday. He said, who's that? He says, Gordon Watson. I said, uh, hey, Gordon, he can score goals. Hey, he says, he's burning up down here. He said, uh, he's, uh, he's really wanting to get back into the game. So I said, uh, give me his number. Let's, uh, let's see if I can set something up. So I got him. Uh, I got him to come up. And I remember his first game at home was Kidderminster. We drew 1-1 and, 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 and Flash could have scored five in that first game. Five. And um, he said to me after the game, he says, oh, I'm, I'm disappointed here. Disappointed, he said. He says, could have had five today. So, but let me, let me tell you, I'll get five next week. And that's how he won. He, he, he backed himself to score uh, uh, every week. And then uh, I remember uh, the, the day we went bottom of the league uh, we played Plymouth away. And Plymouth under Paul Stoke at that time were a very, very good side. And we lost 1-0. And, and in the dressing room after the game, uh, it was the first time, uh, you know, I sensed that we've got something coming together here. And Flash said after the game, says, don't worry, Gaffer, don't worry. He says, it's coming. I feel it in the team. And if they can keep giving me the ball, I'll keep scoring the goals. And uh, our next game would be Hull City, 4-0. Think you scored? You scored that night, Mickey. I did. Yeah, I think I played centre mid as well. And we won four 0 And the club for me, that was the start of the real rise to to go into Cardiff and and and, and all the success that the the club had that 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 night beating Hull four 0 who were top of the league. Uh, that's when we really cracked on. And Flash scored some some uh, magnificent goals. But Flash was good, uh, not just on the pitch but off the pitch. Because he talked a good game. And yeah. uh, he built himself up. One, one pre-season we are doing, the, you know, the forest run. Yes. So, like, you fit, lads. You're Matty Robson's, Holmes, Westy. You're looking probably 15, 16 minutes to get round. Me and Ting should be middle towards the end, so about 18, 19 minutes to finish. So we all had to meet on the grasses. So only person not come in is Flash. So he comes <laughs> talking to me in about 26 minutes. And he starts having a go at everyone. So he's like, what you been doing? You haven't been working hard enough. <laughs> Flash, they have ran a lot quicker than you. He went, nah, I've been running for 26 minutes, which means I've done 26 minutes of work. These have only done 16. They should be doing more running than us. <laughs> That's what he was like. Was it, Chris, what game was it where he broke his leg? Was it Darlington? Oh, Darlington. Well, Darlington. I remember we... And then he went and did his rehab at Portsmouth or Southampton or something like yeah, that. Yeah. I'll yeah. never forget this. And I think, was it John Murray might have been the physio at the time? Yeah. So I said, and was it one day I was like, I was flash getting on because you didn't see me. He didn't have like WhatsApp groups or anything at the time. No. Was it was like, Mickey, he's, he's, he's flying. He said his diet's spot on. He said, every time I ring him, he's eating <laughs> carrots. He said, he's not eating any stuff that he shouldn't be eating. He's training on. <laughs> So he got on the bus one day, we were on the way game, he got on the bus and he looked like he put about a stone and a half on. So he's walking up, <laughs> one of the lads went, Flash, you've been deep frying all them carrots. <laughs> 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 Again, he just, he just shrugged it off, he would just say some comment yeah. and be like, well, whatever, and that's him. I, I remember when I, when I first got, got, I was only really quite obviously new to the club when, when Flash was there, but I remember interviewing him in one of the first games where Paul Mullen let me off a leash and let me interview people. And um, and I said to Gordon, I said, oh, that must have been a, a good feeling. It was a crisp strike. It must have been a great feeling when you saw it hit the back of the net. And I'll never forget you went, I didn't see it at the back of the net, Mark. I was already celebrating. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, that was typical of him, wasn't it? But then I yeah, did, I mean, he was the icing on the cake for the team. He, he, he could finish. I remember, Chris, when you came into the office one, one afternoon in the in, 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 midway, I don't know what, what it was, but you came and sat down in the media office one afternoon and you didn't really say anything. You were just smiling like a Cheshire cat and me and Paul Mullen, like looked at each other and, and you were like, just like really pleased with yourself. And it just got flashed to sign another year. <laughs> and that was like, oh, please, because it was so important. Yeah. Wasn't it, 
Well, goal scorers are, are, are the are the uh, any team that's going to win games need a goal scorer. If you haven't got a goal scorer, um, you, you're going to struggle. I mean, my my big disappointment at Hartlepool at one stage was I had Grant Holt lined up and uh, Graham, who was at um, Middlesbrough, who went on to Watford and Sunderland. I had them two boys lined up to come and to, to play up front for us. That was a disappointment that we didn't get those over the line. But I had them clinched. If we could have had them even in League One, I think we'd have had a potent front two to build a team from the back to, for them two boys up front to score goals. Well, what happened, Chris? Did they just did the last stage fall through? What the? Well, I've been saying that Iowa were backing everything all the way through. <laughs> all right, okay. <laughs> they didn't back them too. <laughs> <laughs> No, uh, you know, I'm a, you know, that's what happens with clubs. You know, um, you, 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 things are going along well, uh, and, and then suddenly uh, the financial taps started to sort of dry up a little bit, and um, suddenly then, you know, it's, it, it becomes a lot harder. Success at Hartlepool up to 2010 had, had been a dramatic rise, and, and people expected that rise to keep going on and on and on and on. And it's not it's not that easy, and um, um, you know consequently, uh, when I returned as manager, when Danny left, you know it was a lot harder. Well, when I say a lot harder, you kind of then start to develop a new team, and um, consequently, uh, I, I, I resigned eighteen months later. Chris, going back to to speak about Iowa and, and the, the time that I was at the club. Everyone listening knows stories about Iowa. But you seem to be able to, to handle Ken and everything that, that he wanted you to do on top of being a football manager as well as anyone. I mean, I, I yeah. thought and, and Danny and, and other managers and they just couldn't, they couldn't seem to handle Ken as well as you did. What was your secret with working with Ken and, and Iowa? Um, I just think it was mutual respect. And, 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 and if Ken said that we couldn't have Grant Holt or we couldn't have... Uh, Graham, uh, Danny Graham. Um, I I accepted it and and got on with it and tried to get whoever's next best or or whatever. And, and uh, I, you know I I had a few good nights out with Ken and me and Russ used to go up and see Ken and have a chat with him. And you 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 know I, I hear it a lot with managers in in in, in the game where they, they, they don't like chairman or they don't understand what's happening. Or, I, I think you've got to be, you have to be level-headed as a manager and you have to realise what people are doing for you and, and, and work with it. And, um, you know, like I said, I, I had great support from Ken and Iowa and Bergen and all them. Uh, I, get, I devoted a lot of my time towards that as well, you know. Um, I, I did a lot, of, a lot of good things for them and uh, represented them at, 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 at times. Um, and I think it worked, it worked both ways. I think the problem that Hartlepool had after that was, was that I don't think Ken could get somebody who was as close as what I was, but, you know, working relationship um, with, with them. And I think they struggled a little bit, certainly with Mike Newell anyhow. Yeah. Uh, one of the things about Ken, I mean, I'll not have a bad word said about Ken. To be fair, he, he, no, he's brilliant, brilliant for the club what he did. Uh, but I remember when you were—I think it was when you were director of sport—and you came to my office one day and said, "Mark, uh, what do you reckon about if I do like a column on the website?" Can you remember this? I don't know if you remember the story. He said, yeah, "I do a column on the website, maybe every week or two, talking about Hartlepool, talk about football in general, maybe the world of sport." And I said, "Hey, that's a good idea." And as it turned out, Ken was in the office. So I went down to Ken and I said, hey, Chris has just had a great idea, Ken. Um, what about him writing a story, like a column on the website every week with all these different things? And Ken went, yeah, that sounds good. That i tell you what to do, Mark. Send us a fax with all the um, information on the, <laughs> that you can talk about and just a few little different ideas about what you think you could do and, and, and we'll, we'll consider it up at Iowa. So I was like, oh, brilliant. So the next day, he'd gone back to, to Aberdeen and I put a little fax together. I spent, I spent a bit of time with Chris. We'll talk about this, we'll talk about that. And I sent this fax, fax up the, to IOR and it was the quickest fax I'd ever got back in my life. It just came back with the word no ringed up. <laughs> just no. Uh, that's Ken. Isn't it? That, 
Yeah, so that's that, that, that's him. And then uh, you move on. You move on. You know. Uh, I, you know. Uh, sometimes you sent in them days faxes. You won't get. You won't get back for four days, five days, and you, you're waiting for the fax to come, and it never came. Um, when when you're trying to sign players, but um, no, I mean when I when I went back there and, Ru and Russ had been, you know, well Russ joined just before I left to go to Sheffield. Uh, um, you know, we had a good we had a, we had a good team together, Russ and I, and and, and helping the managers and and uh, and helping the club along, and and uh, you know we had a great 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 working relationship with Ken. Well, talking to Ken, I, 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 and it, the only bad word I've got to say about Ken happened in the last six months. So I'll tell you the story. Richie Humphries is working for the, the Premier League as an assessor, so he goes to some of the Premier League games for the referees. So he's up in the castle when they play with Man City. So he said, Mickey, do you want to come along? And I was like, I, I, I'll come along, Richie. I don't go to many games, but I'll come along. And so I sat and was sitting and watching the team walk up and just had a general catch up, which was lovely. And out the corner of my eye, and I forget the fella's name, but he was always with Kenny, he had grey hair. Yeah. In the boardroom, anyway. I saw him, so I waved at him. And Bill. Was, Bill. So he signalled to come over. So I walked over, I was about to talk to him, Richie came over. And then Ken turned around, and Ken's son was there as well. Yeah. So Ken's gone, hi, yeah, Richie, and shook Richie's hand. So I put my hand out, and he's gone, hello. <laughs> <laughs> So I've looked, I went, oh, hi, Kenny, you right? And he's just like literally staring at us as though I've never met this guy in my life. Yeah. And his, his son's turned around and went, Dad, it's Mickey Barron. And he must have thought, oh, yeah, I recognise him. No. So he shook me hand and went, hi, Mickey. He went, I didn't recognise you there with your beard. No, I, <laughs> this is the beard that I had at the time. <laughs> Ken, it's only hiding my teeth. <laughs> I, I, yeah, we had a nice catch up and a, a nice talk because I hadn't seen him for a long time. Yeah. But, um, yeah. yeah. How, much nice of a, bit of how much of a role, Chris, did you have to play with, with Ken and Iowa and the systems were in place when Danny Wilson came to the club? Uh, Danny, Danny. Well, it's me who got Danny to come. It's, uh, it's funny. I, I do very well at getting the managers' jobs. I mean, <laughs> when, when, when I left, when I left um, Hartlepool, went to Sheffield, Ian McRae rang me uh, when they were appointing Mike Neal. He says, what do you know about Mike Neal? I said, um, well, I've met him once or twice. I said, but not a lot really, Mike, uh, Ian. He says, can you find some information out? So I rang a few people up and found out a few things about Mike. And then... Uh, I went back, uh, I said, well, you know, he's, he's not got a lot of coaching and this and the other. He said, oh, dear. He says, why, have you appointed him? He says, yeah, Ken's appointed him. So they appointed Mike. Um, when Mike left, I got a phone call again. Could you recommend somebody for us? Now, at that time, um, I'd been on a coaching course years before with, with Neil, Neil Cooper. And I had the best time of my life for two weeks in Lara. <laughs> which is, you know, where the coaching course was. And I roomed with Neil for two weeks. And uh, you only, as everybody knows, you only need to be in Neil's company for five minutes. I was living with him, sleeping with him for two weeks. <laughs> and anyhow, obviously, when I left there, when the course had finished, and soon he got a manager's job, and he was coaching and doing well at Ross County. So I told Ken, I said, there's a guy at Ross County, Neil Cooper, who's doing an excellent job for him. Maybe he's get him down. So I got Neil, the inroad, into, into Hartlepool. When I got fired at Sheffield Wednesday, after they'd after the sacked me, Dave Allen said to me, he said, uh, Chris, he said, he says, the other board members are telling me John Barnes, Bobby Rob I don't think Bobby Robson was at New he went at Newcastle. Bobby Robson and, and there was another couple of international. But I, says, I said, listen, you don't want to be going anywhere near them internationals. You need somebody to come in this club, mould these players that we put together, and get him playing football that's going to get us out of this league. I said, there's one guy I think you should go and get. He says, who's that? I said, Paul Sturrock. Who did the appoint the following week? Paul Sturrock. Um, so I'm forever giving <laughs> advice out, getting clubs managers who go and do well like Neil and Paul. And, uh, you know, it, it's unbelievable. So I have a good thing. And so choice of managers, Paul Cook, Paul Cook, we were playing at Chesterfield. We had no manager. John Sheridan had left. And we're playing um, 
uh, Tre um, Accrington Stanley. Accrington on that night played some absolutely marvellous football. Unbelievable. All kids, 18, 19 years of age, £200 a week, absolutely outplayed us. We had the luckiest 4-3 win ever. So I said to Dave Allen, I says, Dave, if we're not going to give the job to, to Tommy Wright and, and Mark Crossley, I said, we must speak to this guy, Paul Cook, who I'd never met before in my life. I said, but his brand of football is what we, we need to play here. So anyhow, we didn't give the job to him. And I, he says, go and see that go and see that Cook boy. Go and have a chat with him. And I met him up on the hotel on, uh, on the M62, the Hilton. Uh, I sat down with him and after five minutes, I knew that's the man we want we need at Chesterfield and uh, uh, I rang Dave Allen up after our meet I said Dave I've, we've got to meet him you've got to meet him you, you'll like what you hear got to meet him he said well get him to come down to my club in Leeds on Sunday so I got Paul took him down there met Dave Allen gave him the job best best manager Chesterfield ever had so I can't find good managers the next three after Paul though I, I didn't I didn't have a great deal of choosing them I must admit but, um, you know, uh, I've got a lot of experience, you know, I can help clubs, yeah. you know. Yeah. So when, when Danny was there, Chris, I was just starting sort of coaching and I know we had to have meetings and uh, I'll never forget, there was one, I think the first time had been beat at home quite heavily on there. So we were having that meeting on a Monday where in that office on the afternoon and the first team manager at the time had to give a report to Ken. So... They were like, Danny, what have you got to say about the first team? And then we'll go to the reserve team. So it was like, Danny, what have you got to say? Shit. And they were like, <laughs> you can't, you can't, that can't be report for the game. And he just kept going, shit. And I was sitting there going, surely you can't set that up the way you are. Like, that can't be report for the game. But in, in certain circumstances like that, Chris, and I, I, I wouldn't have got the chance to ask at the time, would you have sort of, did a report on Danny's behalf, or would you change anything? I, I, I did. I did a report on every game at Hartlepool. When I was there, I did a report on every game. So I, I, I would have put my report into Iowa regarding the game. Um, yours, yours would have been a bit longer than Danny's. <laughs> yeah, it was a bit longer, than, a bit longer than Danny's. I mean, I remember me, Russ, Ken, and Danny met at the uh, in one of the boxes one day. And um, Ken absolutely roasted Danny about his team selections, about the players and one or two other things. And I'm thinking, Danny's going to Danny's gonna blow up here. He's going to go, wow, he ain't going to have this. And Danny just sat there, listened, 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 listened. Then it was the end of the meeting and me and Danny walked out. And I said to Danny, I says, Danny, you were patient there, yeah, mate. He says, just playing the game, mate, just playing the game. You know, so uh, he was an experienced manager. You know, yeah, it was on the other side. Of that, I remember being out in Durham um, on a night out with the staff. It was probably one of my first nights out. And James Haycock was there, the physio, and Jimmy had, had a Jimmy had, had a few too many. So he got up to Danny, and I, I can't remember. It might have been Godwin, Godwin, aren't we? It might have been him. And Jimmy was like, Danny, I'm better than him. I, I should be play. I should be a professional footballer than him. I never get Danny just went, James, shut up. You don't know what you're talking about. Put his glass down, just walk home. <laughs> <laughs> and James was like, Oh, I think I've really upset Danny there. I was like, Yeah, you probably have done. <laughs> <laughs> hey, once again, Jim Jimmy was a great physio. Yeah, he's just great, it's great. Spurs now. I know. Is it Spurs yeah. now? Spurs. Spurs. I, I spoke to him a couple of weeks ago because Every now and again in my WhatsApp group with the lads, I drop in a newcomer, so I got Ben Clark in and Demi. Yeah. I thought, you know what? Because the lads absolutely loved them, Tinks and yeah, all. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely yeah. loved them a bit. Yeah. Yeah. So I text Jimmy, you know, just about something else. I said, look, do you fancy coming in the WhatsApp group? Because the lads would love to have you. But he, yeah, so he's doing the under 23s at, at Spurs at the moment, and he's still right. with Wheels, doing the Wheels really? national team. Yeah, fantastic. So, yeah, he was brilliant. You know, there's brilliant. another one, another guy we've, we've created. From Hartlepool, he's gone on to bigger, bigger things in the game. Yeah, real, real good figure, but a good Walshie. guy. What about Walshy goalkeeper? Oh, Walshy went brilliant. What, what about what about Walshy? Get, he, uh, get, we had to give him a contract, which was for two, two, two days a week uh, at training and a home game, no away game. Can't can't go to the away games. 
And I remember when we played at Southampton and uh, Ken flew down on the day of the game. And uh, well, she always used to go on the away trips, but uh, he, you know, he'd sleep in the physio's room on the spare, uh, and spare bed. You were me that but, night in Southampton. Uh, and we had, to, we had to keep Walshy on the team coach so that Ken didn't know he was even there. Because I remember when you used, to, you used to go and get your room key, and you used to have to, like the lads would all line up, and you'd see Walshy sneaking along behind <laughs> everyone, so no one in reception could see him. Well, it went in his contract that they could go yeah. to the away games. So, hey, we're good days, good days. Talk about contracts. I remember you, you just reminded us there when Danny Wilson signed as manager, his contract started on the 1st of July. And can you yeah. remember he said that yeah. he was at the training ground on the 28th of June yeah. just to check the facilities out? And Ken said he couldn't. No, <laughs> the 1st of July. <laughs> hey, you never know when he walked into that ground. It could have been a slate fell off the roof, hit him on the head, and he's not our manager. He's not our manager till the 1st of July. Hey, dear. Some strange things. Looking back, Chris, I mean, you know, with hindsight now and everything that's gone on, that decision to leave Hartlepool for Sheffield Wednesday, uh, the back part of 2002, was yeah. Probably, is that a decision that you've ever had any regrets about? Is there any? No, I, I, don't, I don't. I've never had regrets about it. It's like when I left Sunderland. Uh, I, I, I got a bit more money than a Manchester United, but I went to Manchester United because it was Manchester United. And I would have sat at the end of my career thinking, hey, do you remember that when I had that chance to go to Manchester United? I mean, I played for Sunderland, played every game for the previous three years. I uh, just got Player of the Year award and all the adulations of that particular season. Um, and then Manchester United came and, and I felt I couldn't, you know, I didn't want to go back in my life and regret um, not going to Man United. Sheffield Wednesday, if it would have been 71 other clubs, I would not have left Hartlepool. Would not have left. It was the only club I, you know, felt that, it, you know, whatever. And, and, and disappointed. I was disappointed when I got there and I knew what, I saw what I had to work with and, and, uh, and, and where we were heading and trying to, you know, my first day, the first day the physio came to me and gave me four players' names who couldn't train through the week, but would play on Saturday. So I said, so, you know, on Saturday, I've got four players who don't train Monday to Friday, but they're fit to play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll get them fit for you. And, that. and, I'm, and that, that was every week. There was players missing from training. I got lads who were desperate to train at Hartlepool. I had a team, I, I, you know, and, and um, the attitudes of players and it's totally different. Um, and... You know, I'm obviously got my eye on hopefully Hartlepool win the league, which were about ten or twelve points clear at one time, um, and then slowly they nearly it nearly fell away at the end. But uh, you know, they got promoted. My only regret is I didn't stay and get that promotion, mm. and 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 do that, which I'm I'm pretty certain would have would have won the league in the next six weeks the way that uh, we were playing. But it, it, it's one of them things in life that that um, you, you you have a decision to make. And you, you make it for what you think is the right reasons at the time. I know there's disappointment from from the fans at the club, but you, you know it's something that uh, I felt I had to take on and give it a go. Well, I think we, we, well, me and Mark had Mickey Nelson on the other week, and and we said exactly the same. When Nelson was left to go to Norwich, not one of the players sort of questioned it. Or no. and it was the same, Chris, when you left to go to Sheffield, there was not one player in that dressing room even though we're disappointed that you were leaving, they could turn around and say, I don't understand why he's going. I don't yeah. Yeah. know reason why to go. And I think it was obvious at the time why you were going, that that was a club that meant a lot to you. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. It's a massive opportunity. And it's, it, like I said, it, like I said, and else it, people criticise when they're outside, but no one from inside criticised. No. No. Not at no. all. I mean, well, you know, people say, oh, you're disloyal and you're this, that. It's not no disloyalty whatsoever. It, it, it's just uh, an ambition in life to do something and it comes whether at the right time or the wrong time for you. You, you, don't, you might not ever get offered that opportunity again. And something inside you tells you, I've got to take it. I've got to, I've got to give it a go. And, uh, you know, it, 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 it was something that, that uh, I'm proud I've done. I've, I've supported the club, I've played for the club and I managed the club. Yeah, 100%. In terms of when you came back to Hartlepool as well, obviously first as director of 
sport. <laughs> what, <laughs> what was that? <laughs> <laughs> the, but every question, you know, what other sport do we play, Mark? No, no, okay. But anyway, um, <laughs> when one of the things that I remember most about when you were in charge is obviously the whole uh, scenario around Gary Little and the yeah. Little Gate. Can you talk us through yeah. your of that? And, and obviously what led up to a quite emotional um, last day at Brentford. Yeah, well, I mean, um, we'd apparently had a letter the previous week stating that the uh, the forthcoming weekend matches, um, the Football League offices will be closed. Um, so please ensure that any uh, there was an emergency number, etc., etc. Anyhow, so uh, we played at Orient. We're winning three nil, and Orient score three one. Ten minutes to go. Uh, you then start, oh, hey, we're not going to throw this away here. So I turned to Colin, and I'm chatting to Colin about, um, should, should, we, should we just leave one man up front and bring put on a sub and just bolster the result up? We're chatting away like that. By the time you turn around, players are lined up to kick off, and away you go. Um, but what had been happening is that Lids has gone into the back of the net with the same boy who'd scored. They've both gone for the same ball. They're all argy-bargy in the back of the net. they both got a yellow. Um, and we were playing Brighton on the Monday. And um, between the Saturday and the Sunday, nobody had noticed that uh, Gary Little had been booked. I think I don't think even Nick Laughlin had put it in the well, North Echo. I was commentating on the game. Uh, Nick Laughlin was there. Even the guy who, you know, it sounds like we're mounting a defence here, but even the press association guy who's there literally to count the corners, to count the floors, to count the cards. He didn't yeah. put it in none of the reports on the Sunday. <clears throat> So, so on Sunday, nobody rang Maureen up and said Gary Little's being booked. Or there was nothing in. There was nothing. There was not no hint of yeah. of anything. And then we win. We beat Brighton on the Monday, two or three nil, comprehensively in the end. Um, a great win for us. And then a few weeks later, somebody uh, flags it up, and suddenly Gary Little had um, had um, been booked and played when he shouldn't have played. Um, Look through no, uh, you know, not not by, not from us anyhow. And um, then we had to wait six weeks, six seven weeks or something for the FA and EFL to deduct us three points. Forty eight hours before we're playing the last game of the season, which now threw us into a situation. We lose at Brentford on Saturday. We we we're there, and. Um, that was a real pressure game, that. A real, real pressure game. And to be fair to the lads, we, we did extremely well and, and, and got a nil nil. Can you remember your emotions at the end of the game? Got, got well, well, it was because, of, I mean, you know, for 48 hours, you, you're thinking, without, you know, we've got a good chance of going down here. Through no thought of our own. And, and, and yeah, Russ went to the meeting and um, the old uh, uh, the guy from the Football League says, oh, why didn't you get that winning goal last week again? We played somebody at home, drew 1-1, uh, Exeter at home. Why didn't you get that winning goal last week? This is before the trial. This is before the, the thing. Why didn't you get that goal on Saturday? So sort of like Russ then thought, we're going to get this up to some points here. Because if we'd have won 2-1 the week before, they could take the three points off us from the Brighton game and we still stayed up. But instead, they've got to do something. They're going to take three points off us and then 48 hours you're going into the final game of the season it's horrendous if they took up the three points of us with four games to go then you've got four games to, to do something about it you had one game away from home uh last game place of the season. Well, Brentford, a real tough place to go as well tough place. To tough, get, place. To get the tough place but gillingham went down and i remember about 15 minutes to go um the manager of brentford um taylor I, no um uh, I read his name the other day. He's scouting for somebody down south. Um, anyway, he turns to me and said, uh, "How's the matches? What's 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 the scores?" I said, "Well, at the moment, it's uh, it's nil nil. Uh, we're safe, and Gillingham's going down." And he rubbed his hands with glee. I said, "But mind you, though," I said, uh, "and their leading scorer was on the bench." I said, "If you put him on and score, we're going down. Gillingham will stay up." Oh, he looked at he looked at me. Um, and three minutes later, he put a young kid on in goal. <laughs> who, couldn't, who couldn't kick the ball? He put a young kid on. 
<laughs> so, hey, you know, thanks a lot, you know. So, we ended up with a nil nil. <laughs> Talking about playing a goal, Chris, we can't not, not ask you to tell the story about, you know, you had that link and that affiliation with Hartlepool, that, that, that emotion at Brentford that day. But I would, I would guess I'm probably right in saying the first time you played at Hartlepool was for Manchester United. Uh, no, 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 no. First oh. time I played, first time I played there was for Sheffield Wednesday, nineteen seventy-seven. Oh, right, okay. When, 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 when the first time I've ever been to Hartlepool, and we played in a game because Lenny Ashurst was our manager who'd yes, been at Hartlepool, and uh, we played a, a friendly game to try and raise some funds to put a new roof on the uh, on an old stand. And then obviously the next time I went there was for Man United. <laughs> we got beat six, six nil. I think it was. To be fair, Hartlepool were good that night. <laughs> <laughs> was Sir Alex particularly pleased about that result? Well, I mean, it's in sharp as well, but you know, you're going after the game. It's, uh, I think, it's a Wednesday night, and the the, the league season starts on Saturday, and. Um, um, he, uh, Fergie came in after the game and he, he's saying, uh, uh, apart from, uh, uh, I forget who he was, Norman Whiteside, Paul McGrath, something like that, uh, the rest of you are shite, absolute shite. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed, we've just got to be six, I hardly got there. And um, so I said, uh, boss, uh, you know, well, it's a team game, it's a team game. I said, um, if we're shite, those two are shite as well. What a team game. Well, he just absolutely exploded in my face. He came there. There. Who do you think you are, goalkeeper? Goalkeeper. You have just let six in. Six. Hardly put. Oh, ranting and raving right up, right in front of your face. And then he walked away and he took his jacket up and he came back for some more. And he gave it me even more. So, yeah, you know. Uh, as the shower gets on, the bus goes home, goes back into training ground at the cliff the next day. All the lads have heard about it. Oh, he's got it. He's been blasted it. And all that. He's had the air dryer treatment. And then uh, Norman Davis, kit man, says, Hey, Chris, uh, Gaffer wants to see you upstairs in his office. So I'm going upstairs thinking, Oh, he's going to give me some moss to hear. What's all this about? So I knocked on the door quite quietly. Knocked on the door and uh, come in. So he'll go in there. He got up from behind his desk. I'm waiting for it. Shook me by the hand and he said, "You're right, Chris. It's a team game. We're all in it together." Well said, son. And off I went. Couldn't believe it. <laughs> and, and and I'd seen him. And whenever I see him, um, I haven't seen him for a while now. But whenever I see him, it's as good as gold. It's good <laughs> as gold. It's good as gold. But uh, when you get the air dryer treatment from Fergie. You, you, you're getting it, mate. You're getting it. You're getting it. Did you ever get the hair dryer treatment off Chris, Mickey? Um, no. To be honest, I can't really remember Chris shouting that much. And I remember the, the one thing I can remember, I, I, you know me, but I'll not know remember what game it was, but we'll get them beat off, right? And Chris has come in. You weren't a shouter, though, Chris. Were you? I, can't, I can't remember you shouting that often. But not, you, re you, not really. I can uh, tell you are angry, so obviously you're getting beat, you're angry. So Chris has said his thing and he's, he's kicked the, the, the Mansfield. Mansfield the sandwiches. And and the whole thing scattered everywhere. There's the sandwiches, cups of tea everywhere. But so we are all looking at I can't remember who it was, it's probably Westy or someone sat next to me. And I turned around and Westy's like giggling away. And Chris is what well, must have hurt his foot as he's, as he's like hobbling off on to go into the room and back. But that's one of the only memories I can I can remember of Chris like losing his rag really in the dressing room. Yeah. Um one well, one one story was Ills, but we played um um who was it now? Um ex Newcastle Reading, played Reading Ills, but and um we we were Two nil down the half time, and it could have been five or six. They absolutely tortured us, and we're two nil down. And I said to Westy, I said, God knows what we're going to say when we're going here. We were so bad, it was embarrassing, embarrassing. So as I'm going up the tunnel, you know, sometimes you have these flashes of, of inspiration, <laughs> and uh, you, you can say, um, and I thought to myself, well, I can't have a go at these lads. I said, I thought they're so bad. If I have a go at them, 
they're going to be, you know, they're going to be so deflated. They'll go out second half and it could be, it will be five or six. So I, I thought, hey, let's give them a good bit of pat on the back. Let's give them a bit of psychology. So I went in. They all sat down. They're all quiet, obviously, after the bad first 45 minutes. And I thought, and I said, right, listen, three things we've got to do. One, we've got to get in the faces. Two, we've got to close them down with a bit of momentum. And three, we must score the next goal. We must score the next goal. Let's get out there, prove the fans that we can do it. Well, within five minutes of going out, Cootie's whacked one in from 30 yards, and we end up winning 3-2. And, you know, uh, against uh, Alan Pardew and Reading, who, who had a good side. And it just shows you that you don't have to rant and rave in the dressing room to get a result. It's, it's, it's by getting the, the next goal, my opinion. Yeah, something, something on similar lines. I remember when Yorgi was manager, um, he came in and it was, I think the, the lads had played okay, but he was disappointed with like certain things within the game. And some of the lads' reaction after the game, he wasn't that happy with. So Monday morning, like, I said, Gaffer, what we're going to do is, is like, Mickey, we're going to put all the stuff in the middle, and me and you are just going to go for a walk. And I was like, what are players going to do? He was like, well, they're not listening to what I want to do on a, on a weekend <laughs> in the game. Like, yeah. Honestly, so we, we've got all this stuff, we put it in the middle of the pitch. And he just started walking around the pitch and we were just having a chat as well. There was only two of us. And the lads came out of train and they got the balls out, started kicking it around. And you could see them looking over thinking, well, yeah. we got train here. He was like, do not speak to them. Just keep walking around, keep walking around. And in the end, I, I, when the lads came out, I said, Mickey, we're ready to train now. And like, <laughs> he brought them, everyone back in and he, he said, this is why we're doing it. And the, you could see the lad one by one going, oh, yeah, we understand what you're doing. That you was like, so you can just crack on. And he's still doing <laughs> so many things. Like, but again, sometimes doing what's not obvious gets the players to change their yeah. sort of yeah. That's a prime yeah. example of what you said there. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it's strange things. I mean, when I went back, when I went to Sheffield Wednesday in 1988, uh, they were struggling down the bottom of the old first division. And I've been there three or four weeks, and Peter Eustace, who was the coach, to Howard Wilkinson. Peter says, Chris, can you have a word? So I said, yeah, what's wrong, Peter? He says, no, no, no. He said, nothing wrong. He said, what do you think about the place? What do you think's happening in training? So I said, well, do you want me to be honest, Peter? So he said, yeah, be honest. So, you know, want to know. I said, well, that's a board. I said, all we're doing all day is set plays, uh, drills where we're getting the ball, knocking it in the channel, knocking it out wide, bang, bang, bang. Um, and and uh, I said, the boys want to get some uh, eight v eight games, get a sweat on, and get some, you know, some 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 banter, some laughs, enjoy the training. Uh, interesting, he goes. Interesting, uh, interesting. Hey, thanks a lot. Anyhow, so we go in that training next day. Big goals are out. Pitches marked out. Eight v eight game. Howard's not come. Peter's taking training. Do exactly what we were saying. What I said we ought to be doing. Lads are loving it, laughing, joking, enjoying it, putting in working, and all that. And then. Training's finishing. We're walking off the training ground. Who starts to come through the door down the bottom end? Howard. Howard comes through. And we're thinking, <laughs> you know. He walks up. He goes, lads, lads, over you come, over you come. He said, now, you've had your training. Come back at two o'clock and we'll do my training. That was it. That was it. Killed it. You know? I'm thinking, what's Peter been saying to him? You know? <laughs> but that was his psychology, you see. That was how yeah. it played a bit of psychology as well, you know. Got to do it sometimes. Sometimes you get, and then sometimes when the team's playing well, and you go in and you you, you think I'll have a go at them today. I'll have a go. One player you couldn't have a go at was Paul Smith. Paul Smith. If you had a go at Paul Smith, he crumbled, and he he, he went into himself. And I always used to say to the lads, get the ball out to him. He'll create us goal scoring chances. And he might have been absolutely shocking him for a start, but you have to you have to build him up and build him up. And and by Christ, he could whip a ball in with his left foot. Yeah. You knew it was coming in. Good player. Good player. No, Chris, I really appreciate we both really appreciate you coming on and spending right. some time and, and, and going down memory lane with us. It's uh, been fantastic. So thank you for yeah. that. Yeah, well, pleasure, pleasure, boys. Yeah. Well, let's hope uh, Hartlepool can uh, 
pick itself up and get and get itself going again, man, eh? That's what's, re yeah. what's required. All right, well, have a good night, boys, and thank you very much. So, Mick, there's another episode of Switcher Play uh, done and dusted. It was great to hear some of the stories that Chris had and just remember some of them great times. Yeah, definitely. I think the one thing with Chris is, and, and I, I don't speak to him as much as I would like to, really, or probably should do, is that enthusiasm he has for football. You hear him when he's talking about Wakefield and, and all the clubs he's been out. He's, he's a football man and he's been in the game a long time. And um, I think people like Chris should be used more within football, whether it's in coaching or... It's got so much to offer managers and advise them and stuff like that. So hopefully he does get back in the game in some some way. And um, it's just nice, to, as you say, to hear some of them stories and, and some of the players he's played with and managed and, and sold on. It's great to hear him. He remembers everything as well, doesn't he? He remembers the opponents, what game, what happened, what the score was. They put me to shame. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Well, no, I thoroughly enjoyed that again, Mick. So, um, brilliant. So, um, yeah. I guess we'll round it up there. And that's that's this episode of, of Switcher Player. Thanks very much, everyone, for, for tuning in again. And uh, we'll be back very soon with a, another guest to, to hopefully bring back some, some more great memories. But uh, thanks, everyone, and see you later.